well, I guess many people were sort of inventing the term at the time, but I remember kind of making it up. You know, for me, I hadn't heard it before. Um, when I was finishing my first book, The Beauty Myth, and it it was kind of an early exercise in uh, if you build it, they will come thinking. Because at the time I wrote The Beauty Myth, everyone was saying feminism is dead, no one's interested, um, it's over. And in fact, there wasn't a lot of, there was almost no activity on the part of young women especially. And second wave feminists were, you know, their mom's age. So I said at the end of the book, you know, there's going to be this third wave of feminism. And I sort of was hoping, well, you know, if I say it, maybe someone will join up, you know. And of course, other people like Rebecca Walker were also using the phrase at the, about the same time. What's the definition? I, you know, I don't think it really needs to have a rigorous definition. I've never been one who's a fan of labels. To me, it just means women who are younger, substantially younger than second wave feminists. You know, does that generation of third and probably now fourth wave feminists have different uh, a different style in their feminism? I think there's some differences, and they're good differences. I think third wave feminism tends to be much more pluralistic about sexuality and personal expression and you know, fashion choices and much less dogmatic, which I think is great. I think third wave feminism tends to be more alert than some second wave feminists were to issues of uh, class and race. Um, I think third wave feminists are more engaged, tend to be more engaged with uh, being willing to use power, like to use the media or to use the, the uh, electoral process or to use consumer uh, practices for a good outcome, which is great. Like second wave feminism tended to be kind of puritanical. Like we can only be really good if we don't touch the marketplace, we don't touch the media, we don't touch, you know, uh, politics as usual. Um, but apart from that, I mean, what I love about, what I love about being kind of superannuated, you know, I love being kind of the dinosaurs and, and letting the young ones kind of carry the ball forward. Um, I mean, what I love about the third wave and the fourth wave is that it's time for them to make their own mistakes, you know, to create their own theories and, you know, throw up their own leaders. Um, and that's as it should be. That means that a, a movement is alive and vigorous. Um, I did write a piece in which I said that Westerners should beware of being presumptuous in assuming they know that a hijab means oppression to a woman wearing it. And where did I get that from? I got it from feminists in the Muslim world um, saying again and again things like, you know what, we have much worse problems than this. <laughs> you know, it's much more urgent that they're burning, you know, brides or that, you know, we're facing forced clitoridectomies. Like you Westerners are so preoccupied with our wearing a headscarf, you know, get a grip. This is, you know, like grow up. Um, and, and many, many feminists I've heard from, including uh, young women in Western Europe, and I think it's very interesting, and I was just reporting what they said. Um, they said very intriguingly to me, as the author of The Beauty Myth, that when they wore the headscarf or modest clothing, like a hijab, they chose to do so. And these are, I mean, I'm talking about like the head of the Oxford Union, you know, this beautiful, brilliant young Muslim woman who could have worn anything she wanted, and she chose to wear a headscarf. And she said, for her, uh, wearing a headscarf or more modest clothing made her feel freer in a Western context than wearing Western clothing, freer of objectification, freer of sexual harassment, freer of having to worry all the time about how she looked compared to fashion models. And I thought that was intriguing. Um, and I thought it was intriguing to surface these comments because I think, you know, we're in such deep conflict with the Muslim world right now, we on the, in the West. And one of the problems is our, you know, their presumptions about what our culture means and stereotypes about Western corruption and our presumptions about what their culture means and stereotypes about Islam. So I think it's healthy for Westerners to turn a lens on Western practices. Gee, maybe, you know, it's not necessarily so free to uh, define freedom in this very reductive way we do in the West as, you know, any kind of sexual expression, any kind of purchasing power, any kind of, you know, secular practice. Uh, maybe there are other ways of looking at how other people see us. And even if we don't agree with those ways, I do think that it's a very important time to be engaged in an open dialogue with, his, you know, with the Muslim world and be open to hearing 
you know, Muslim women's own interpretations of what the hijab means for them. Are there many other Muslim women who think it's very oppressive? Absolutely. And I remember saying in the piece that that is true, of course. Mm -hmm.